Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, today we're taking a look at not a local fair, not a county fair, but the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Fun fact. Ooh, fun fact. Mate. It happened in 1893. <laughs> that was a really fun fact, Luke. Well, but and the other thing too was like when I think of a fair, I think a fair is like, you know, it's like a weekend Me. kind of oh. thing. This thing went from May 1st, 1893 to October 30th, 1893. Yeah, it was a long time. It was a big realize, fair. Yeah, like the Butler Fair. It's like a week or yeah. something like that at most. Yeah, that's... that's Or the St. Mary's Fair. It's it, probably, I don't think they have one. It's like a half a day. Yeah. <laughs> probably. Uh, I'm going to start with a little honesty here, Luke. Oh, no. Is that okay? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest about okay. this. Okay. I had to Google if the 1893 Chicago's World Fair was the same thing as the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Turns out they are. They are. Good and to do, know. And do you know what it's celebrating? I do, but I'd like you to go ahead and explain it. So the so the the official name of it the official name of it is World's Fair Columbian Exposition is the official name. It was shortened to the Columbian Exposition. It was also called the Chicago World Fair. And this is all about the four hundredth anniversary of our boy, friend of the show, Christopher Columbus, arriving to the New World in Fort. 1892. Yeah, which is interesting that they had it in 1893 then, huh? Uh, I mean, give or take give the or 400th. Take. But yeah, I had to Google that because yeah. I, it kept coming up and it was stealing my information that I thought happened in Chicago. And I'm like, was this in Columbus? Was this in Columbia? I didn't know what. Yeah, I, that's, that's what I thought. I thought it was in Columbia. Yeah. But apparently Columbia doesn't really do these things. No, they don't. I'm fairly certain it's mostly drugs and murder and kidnapping. Wow. There goes our entire Colombian yeah, fan base. Way to go, Luke. Just saying. It's usually me who does that. Fun fact for you. Shoot. It's estimated that one in four Americans saw the Colombian Expo in 1893. I heard more. I really? actually heard that. So the number that I heard was 23.7 million visitors. And if you look at the current U.S. population in 1893, it's like one third. But... The reason why it might be less is a lot of it was foreign visitors and oh. people from other countries. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, 27 a lot of people, million huh? people. Yeah. Whew. I wonder how many the St. Mary's Fair gets or the um, Butler Fair. I'm not sure. Yeah. All so, right. A couple other fun facts. Ooh, or I love it. I'll say stats, James. Ooh. Stats is probably the better thing. So the fair itself occupied 690 acres, roughly, uh, of land whenever they built this in almost... Somewhere in the neighborhood of like 99% of it is missing today. They purposely built this thing with all these temporary structures. So all these buildings you see, like when you look at the pictures and some of the old timey black and white videos they show of this, I mean, these buildings are beautiful, but they knew they were going to tear them down. So apparently what I heard was a lot of it was like movie set building. Like oh, it really? wasn't meant to be like super permanent structures. Like a lot of the stuff that you see is stone is more of a facade rather than, you know, actual, uh, Admission, 50 cents. In today's dollars, that would Ooh. cost about 12 bucks to get That's in. still a pretty good deal. It's not bad. I mean, this was a big deal, so 50 cents, that seems like a great well, they bargain. Said, well, they, but it wasn't just that, but they said people were literally like selling their cars, doing second mortgages on their homes so that they could travel to the World's Fair and take their family to go see the World's Fair. Apparently, it was like a big deal. That's poor decision making yeah, right it there. Is. I'd be like me and you saying, oh my goodness, i got to sell my car to go to Kennywood. <laughs> Kennywood's open. Yeah, it is. Is it? That's an inside joke yeah. for anybody that doesn't live in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, anyways. Uh, so there was over 65,000 unique exhibits. 65,000? 60, wow. Now, some of them were pretty small. You know, it was like some it's guy. It's like the person selling their homemade jewelry. Yeah. And that's the other thing, too. A lot, every, it was, a, it was an, a trade show, so they sold. The majority of the stuff there was actually sold. I uh, watched a cool video about how like they have artifacts that still have the price tags on them. Uh, 46 different countries were there, and I already mentioned it opened in May and closed in October. Yeah, that's very cool. So a little bit more about the buildings. 
you said that most of them were kind of fake, yeah. or at least temporary. They knew they were coming down. They built like 200 buildings in total for this thing, yeah. which is kind of nutso. But they had 14 of them that, they were, that were called great buildings, and those were kind of the ones that were supposed to last forever. Some of those did last. Like, and I think one's did. a museum right now, I think. Yeah. So all of these buildings together were known as the White City. Did you see that? Yes. All right, so they were known as the White City, but the 14 main great buildings uh, were in the Grand Basin, and they were like the administration building, the agriculture building, manufacturing, and liberal arts for some reason. I don't know why you would include that, but that's fine. Mines and mining, electricity, manu- machinery, women's building, transportation building, fisheries building, forestry, hor- horticulture, and anthropology. So of all of these, only two of them still stand in place the palace of fine arts and the world's congress auxiliary building so three other ones uh survived the fair and have kind of like moved around like they kind of tore these suckers down and then rebuilt them in other locations i I have a whole spiel about they tore it down here and they built it there like i think one went to norway then it came back and went to little norway in wisconsin Ooh. for all of our wisconsin listeners out there we got a lot out there go we ducks do. ducks i don't know <laughs> i'm assuming that's a mascot for some place in wisconsin apparently they're not all badgers or they're, cheese heads they're blue devils or cheese heads they are all cheese heads that's for sure but also apparently there was a viking ship there that's pretty like a re- you, like a legit one i don't know if it was a legit one i think it was probably like a replica okay. viking ship but they had the viking ship that was just sitting around out there and it was sailed to the exposition from norway by captain magnus anderson and located in geneva illinois he sounds and, like a man's man magnus yeah yeah, I thought that's pretty cool. And you said it sprawled all over the place. You told us when it was open, right? Yeah. Interesting. So fun fact, uh, the selection process started like 10 years before this. Right. And they were up against St. And, and they were up against St. Louis and New York. And how? And D.C. And D.C. And how Chicago got it? Because 20 years prior, Chicago, like half of Chicago burned down. I think that was a lot of the appeal and the reason that oh, they wanted to do this to though. rejuvenate Chicago. They wanted to show like how Chicago's bounced back and then oh. to get more people in there to show what a great city it is even after the fire. Yeah. But there was like two big, at least from what I could tell that like St. Louis and DC weren't as big of competitors. New York was the big one. New York had like uh JP Morgan. They said they'd pay for the whole people. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes no sense how, like you're saying, how Chicago then won. When I mean, New York's the, New York. Yeah, at the time, Chicago was was really small at the time because, again, half of it burned down 20 years prior. So uh, kind of surprising. But a good story for all the people that live in the Windy City. <laughs> That's really good. Fun fact, it wasn't oh called the Windy City before the fair. What? Apparently, um, a lot of the journalists that were covering the fair over these three months or whatever it was, these journalists actually, um, one, I, I don't remember the person's name, but it actually was coined the Windy City because, you know, when you're there, it's windy. And I guess no one actually like said, hey, the city's really windy right now. Let's call this the Windy City. Wow. The first time ever. Is that true? Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. Very interesting. Huh. The things you learn on our show, the James. Things you learn. I even am learning, which I is know. great. Uh, one last thing I wanted to say about this whole setup was that they primarily say four people were in charge of all of the design. They had three architects, who I don't really care about, and then they had one guy, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a landscape architect. And I was like, why do I know that name? And it turns out that back in the day, I took Larch 60 at Penn State, landscape architecture. It's like the ultimate, you don't have to do anything class. So it it fills, fulfills one of your arts or something sorts of credits that you need. It's like 600 people in an auditorium. And then you just take multiple choice tests. And you learn how to like cut grass and mulch. Well, it's like more about landscaping not like putting mulch mulch down but (laughs) the beauty and the symbolism and symmetry and great gardens and stuff you make it sound amazing it wasn't actually a bad class i thought it was interesting i'm sure business majors had a tough time with it but i think you'd be okay in it oh i'm sure if it's still something penn state students sign up for that one 
All right. Uh, moving on. Before we go any further into like Ooh. exhibits and what okay, happened okay. there, let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. Ooh, I have to assume it's Chicago Tourism. WindyCity.com. WindyCity.com, in fact, did not sponsor us this episode, <sighs> but we do have some shout outs. I sure hope so, because we haven't talked in a while. We better have gotten some fan mail in the we, meantime. We do have some fan mail. Nice. R-E-Y wrote in. And he, this one's the worst. Oh. He used our episode for uh, a paper on the Manhattan Project. So he said, so I hope are, that it's accurate. Are we published? I think so. I guess that's are how you, it is. Wow. By published, I mean it's in school. So you know how like whenever you like do the, the what, what, what's that called? Uh, when, when you're writing a paper and you got to give Citing? credit. Yeah. So he cited. I hope he on, cited on professional engineering. <laughs> that awesome. would be great. Hopefully, I, I wrote in my notes, hopefully his paper doesn't uh, bomb. Get an F. <laughs> Ari, get you'll it. have to email us back and let us know if you got, I'm sure, like over 100% if you cited on professional Probably, engineering. I would imagine. Also, fun fact he wrote in about the Manhattan Project, John Van Newman was one of the nerds that's often, uh, that is often not talked about from the Manhattan Project, even though he played a big role. And that's because he was a bad example and a bad role model. He used to gamble a lot and chase the ladies and Ooh. things like that. So he got left out of the history books. So be that a lesson to you, kiddos. Be a good person or else your accomplishments don't matter. I agree. Then there's Ivan C., who also wrote in, longtime listener, loves the show, and would suggest that we do an episode about RC oh cars. Oh, goodness. How do we never do that before? I, I, I loved them growing up. Did you? Yeah. I, I, I got into like building them and tearing them apart and taking pieces off of one and making another one. I loved RC cars. Huh. Did you know that uh, Jeff from the Mold Flow team yep. used to race them professionally? That's a thing? It's a thing, yeah. He wow. like would have sponsors and stuff. That's nuts. I know. I thought it was really weird. So anyways, those are our shout-outs for the week. Don't if, forget to subscribe. That's right. Don't subscribe. forget to write reviews. Write reviews on iTunes or wherever you listen. Each and every one of your friends and family members should hear about us. Absolutely. And if you subscribe and send us an email, we'll shoot you some... Not we, James primarily, because I've never <laughs> done it. Not primarily. <laughs> James only will send you some uh, some stickers and goodies. That's right. Well done, Luke. Thank you. All right, moving on. You so, ready to move on? Yeah, can, can, can I do a fun fact? I mean, I'm not stopping so you. So fun fact, unbeknownst to the festival goers, they were in the midst of a mass murder spree in Chicago uh, that transpired during the fair. So for several years leading up to the fair and actually during the fair, Herman Mug, Mugget? Mudget? Uh, a.k.a. H.H. H. Holmes, was busily luring victims to uh, a three-story building, and it was called the Murder Castle, where he would torture, mutilate, and kill them, which is crazy. I've never heard about this cat before. And interestingly, the Chicago, one of the, one of the Chicago papers actually paid him uh it's called the uh the hearst newspaper chain paid him two hundred thousand dollars to or in today's money paid him two hundred thousand dollars to actually write the accounts of his murders like murder writing books or something that's terrible could you imagine you're you mortgage your house you go to the fair to go check out you know one of tesla's things because our, our good friend george washington george westinghouse was there showing off some of tesla's stuff and your family gets murdered by h h holmes luring you up to a building that would be terrible yeah be that a lesson to you kiddos don't get lured up to a don't building don't get lured don't get lured be safe the reason we're actually doing this episode is because my wife read a book about this murdering oh. thing and she kept reading me cool facts about what went on in the fair other than the murders which were not cool okay uh but all oh, the definitely. creations we do not condone the murder that's right so that's what made me think or i guess she said do this or else i'm this leaving fun. i liked it and so that's that so far that so was good. a good that was a good cover up all right so the big reason everybody wanted to be there was the world's first ferris wheel Okay. Did you? <laughs> was that it? You didn't have anything to, to <laughs> no, add no, to that? No, I, I no. That was good enough? I don't, I'm, I'm saving it for my rant. Oh, goodness. Jo <laughs> so maybe I shouldn't talk about no, it No, no, no. You can talk about it. You can talk George about it. George Washington Ferris Jr. was a civil engineer specializing in bridges and other structural steel. 
And when designs were called for the Chicago World Fair trying to compete with the Eiffel Tower, it ends up that this cool-looking wheel that people could ride around on is what won. So that's something interesting. So Paris had the 1889 World's Fair, and that's when the Eiffel Tower showed up. If you haven't listened to our episode on that, our check boy, it out. Georgie Eiffel. Gustav. Oh, Gustav. We'll call him Georgie Gustav Eiffel. And yeah, fun fact, Ferris was a graduate of Rensselaer Polytech Institute and a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania bridge builder. He uh, made this enormous engineering marvel. This thing was 264 feet tall. Pictures of it, I mean, even in today's standards, are like like monstrous. Monstrous. It could word. hold, and I don't believe this because I looked at the picture. It said it could hold 2,160 people That's at one time. That's what I heard, too. Like, I'm looking at the pictures. There wasn't enough. I mean, and, unless the, the perspective. The things were huge. Yeah, the, they were really wide. The things the, I, I was going to say seats, but they're not. The booths that they're booths that you that sit in. got pulled around on. Yeah, which is bananas. Yeah, 260-foot wheel, 2,160 passengers? That's nutso. Uh, the contraption rotated on a 71-ton, 45-foot axle. <sighs> Isn't that crazy? They said it saved the fare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah they, How could it not? They said that uh, the finances and the bickering and all the kind of craziness leading up to this, uh, apparently that's what brought people in, and they were charging 50 cents a ride, and, and, they, and then they, they, they sold it uh, to uh, – ten. where'd it go? Uh, it moved to Chicago's north side yeah, after the it. fair, where it remained in operation for 10 more years. And then the organizers of the 1904 World Fair in good old St. Louis uh, bought it and used it um, in 1904. Did you see that when it first got moved to that north, what was it, the North Shore area? Yep. Clark Street and Wrightwood Avenue, apparently, wherever those are, Chicago people. Um it withstood a lawsuit by William Boyce, founder of the Boy Scouts of America, and other local residents who were like, I don't want yeah, that in oh, my neighborhood. A little uh, not in my backyard. Yeah. So that's interesting. So uh, a little bit more about it. At the time of its creation, that giant axle and whatnot, it was the largest hollow forging of its time. So that's cool. Uh, the... It was manufactured in Pittsburgh. Yep. I thought I'd throw that out there by Bethlehem Iron Company and weighing weighed in at 89,320 pounds. And it had two big old 16-foot diameter cast iron spider spiders, like spidered cast iron things, yep. like the like prongs that stick out. They were generatively designed, I'm sure. I think they were generative. No, they weren't generatively designed. No? No, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> that would be inaccurate. They weighed 53,000 pounds. This sucker cost 300,000 smackers to build. Wow. So those little cars that rotated like then around. then or now money? Then money. Okay, so that's probably like a lot that's more That's probably now money. a lot of monies okay. now. Uh, 36 cars. Each fitted with 40 revolving chairs. I think I would get motion sick on this thing because that happens to me a lot. And uh, it could accommodate up to 60 people per car, apparently. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of people. That's that's so many people. 38,000 38, passengers per day. So that's a whole lot. And it took 20 minutes to complete two revolutions. How boring is that? Well, I went on the London Eye, and that was pretty cool because there's oh, all of London to see. That's one that always gets knocked over in all the superhero movies, right? I, I don't know. Maybe. Okay. But I thought it was cool, but that's because I was in London, and they, you could see Big Ben and all that. I don't know what there really is to see in Chicago, yeah. or at least at that time what there was to see. But you could see the whole fair, so okay. that's kind of cool, right? So, so that's something. Oh, it took 200 pounds of dynamite to bring it down. Boom. To move it or to destroy it? To destroy some parts oh, okay. of it. Yeah. So that's all I had to say about that. Now, so it, there's other stuff to go on to, but I figured now would be a great time to take a break for Luke's rant. Okay, so this is my rant. How do you say what we were just talking about? What's, what's the name of this device? Ferris wheel? Ferris wheel. So for probably, I'm not, I don't want to divulge my age, but probably for like the last 27 years... <laughs> Uh, I called it a Ferris wheel. Ferris, because it's the fairest of it's, them all. It's a Ferris like wheel. F I R, and I literally have had this argument. F A I R E S T. There's a there's a T in there somewhere when I say it, and Ferris like wheel. everybody I know, I don't know if I just have 
So me and my wife, this has been an ongoing argument in our marriage that I call it a Ferris wheel, not a Ferris wheel. So this is your rant, is that you don't know how to pronounce words? Well, I, 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 I'm just wondering, do other people, and I think it's maybe <laughs> no like I say. calls it that. No, I, I feel like I, maybe I'm saying it quickly, so it's like, oh, Ferris wheel. <laughs> There's no, like, if the next word started with a T, maybe, like it was Ferris wheel, then I could buy this. But Ferris wheel doesn't have a Ferris wheel. There's no, there's no reason wheel. you should have a T in there. So when I say it quickly, you notice. When I say, oh, look at this Ferris wheel. A little bit. It, I wouldn't call you out on it. It's not that pronounced. Okay. But so my rant is my wife. That's all she does. I'm not. I'm is not call me out in. on how I pronounce the Ferris wheel. Well, when you say it slowly, you definitely can hear it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of my rant. Like, it's more like I know you're the resident unprofessional engineering lexicon. I am. And I just wanted to get your take on my pronunciation, which I know is totally wrong because I know there's not a T in it. Like, I don't know why I ever put a T in it. It is wrong, but it's wrong of her to sass you about it. It is wrong. I agree. She should love you for you and all of your. So she's not a listener of the show. (laughs) So you're not helping me here. Oh, well, I'll write her a note. Okay, moving on. Moving on. So I wanted to talk quickly about electricity. Good, because that, that was a big one. You can, you can start, because I don't have much on that. I got a whole bunch of other firsts that it, I'd like to cover. It turns out electricity was a big thing here at the Chicago Columbian World Fair Exposition. Well, this was right in the, the hunt of ACDC, right? <laughs> The band? No, yeah. no, not the band. The no. whole, the yes. whole ACDC battle. So if you haven't listened to any of our shows on those cats, we got some, uh, some shows. Yeah. Make sure you check, check out, them out Tesla and Westinghouse yeah. for sure. I don't yeah. think we've done a GE or Edison. Yeah. Have we done Edison? I don't know. Anyways, electricity debuted in 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia. Boo. <laughs> uh, it was, however, not welcomed, and it was considered not very safe by the public. So public perception is everything. Well, you heard why it was unsafe. Why was it unsafe? Because we talked about it in the one. The, the guy was, like, getting cats and electrocuting them near where the, the <laughs> his shop was, what... saying that he, he was paying kids to kill cats. Yeah. I mean, I have a cat, so I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so at the Columbian Expo, the electricity was reintroduced, and it was used prominently. But to make it less cat killing, they actually used it for the amusement park and a lot of the fun stuff and new technology going on at the fair to show that, look at all the great things that it can do for you mm-hmm. in your life. So two companies in particular, GE and Westinghouse, proposed different ways to provide power. So I believe... I believe it was something like 1.5 million GE first said it's going to cost, and then they dropped the number down to 500,000 when they were losing. Yeah. But Westinghouse was still quoted at 400,000, and their setup was just way more efficient and uh, better for, for the needs. And this is what ended up happening, that Westinghouse got <clears throat> selected for this, even though GE was being backed by Thomas Edison and J.P. Morgan at the time. Uh-huh. And so they went with this, and the Tesla system, which was made up of all these switchboards and generators and whatnot, uh, was basically uh, everything that was then powered, and that's what then made uh, his power system. Or that's I guess cool. I guess because his patents got sold to Westinghouse, the Westinghouse power system kind of take over the world. Yeah. So yeah. Big deals with the electricity. Lots of big deals. And apparently th- apparently there was a ton of other, I'll say, firsts. There so were so many. I have a whole bunch. Me I got too. a bunch of like food first, and I got some like engineering. I want to do the food first because I think I those are the, the funnest. So, okay. They're the uh, most funnest. Um, so, and, and the crazy thing is I love all these things. Really? Or some. So, <laughs> so the first one is uh, cream of wheat. Like I grew up. My grandmother Ooh, would make so me gross. lumpy cream of wheat. It was uh, so good. You'd put big, huge pads of butter in it. So cream of wheat uh, well, maybe that. Uh, was introduced then. Uh, this one amazed me. The first ever brownie was invented by Bertha Palmer. Really? Are you kidding me that people couldn't enjoy brownies before I love 1893? You, Bertha. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Love Milton Hershey worked with some European exhibitors and introduced his caramel manufacturing business. Really? Adding caramel and chocolate together. I, I gotcha. 
juicy fruit gum. It's I love the juicy you. fruits, other than the fact that it loses its flavor in seven oh, seconds. Oh, that's so bad. So there was a whole thing about Wrigley's chewing gum there, which makes sense because it's Chicago, right? Yeah. But the company was founded in 1891, which is a little bit before. It started selling products like soap and baking soda, and then it made this sweet transition into chewing gum, where it had all sorts of different flavors like Vassar and Sweet 16, Peppermint, Lemon Cream, and Blood Orange. These are all interesting. But you're right. Juicy Fruit was the one that kind of took took the world like by storm. Fruit. Yeah, I do too, but you're right. Yeah. Did you ever have Fruit Stripe gum? Oh, I love it. It's like it literally it, it hits your tongue and then it's gone, <laughs> yeah, the flavor. It's so bad. Uh, so I, I, I'll you have one in there that I'll save till the okay. end. But so like Quaker Oats, I love Quaker Oats. I eat them to this day. Uh, shredded wheat, I love shredded wheat. Aunt Jemima pancakes are by far my favorite pancakes. In Vienna sausages. Vienna sausages were created there. Yeah, the little little yeah, things I that come in Vienna the sausages. Oh, yeah. So did you see the pancake mix created by Chris Rutt? Uh, what? Aunt Jemima didn't make it? No, but Nancy Green actually is, or at least was, Aunt Jemima. And they used her likeness as the like symbol on the product. Oh, okay. And then she would do demonstrations on how to use the premix at the fair and was nicknamed the Pancake Queen by I the love, officials. I, love, I had Aunt Jemima just like two weeks ago. Did you? Yeah, nice. I love it. So good. And yeah. then you had one on your list. I want to make sure you saved the... Uh, the beer one. Are you saying Cracker Jacks? Is oh, that what you're I talking see about? Cracker Jacks. Yeah, Cracker Jacks. Yeah. So that's really cool. So Frederick William Rackheim, a German immigrant. Did I nail that? Yeah, you did. Okay, I thought so. Nailed and his it. brother Louise. Nailed it. Uh, were first were first to add peanuts to molasses flavored candy coated popcorn and created Cracker Jacks, which is gross. I hate I Cracker hate Jacks. Cracker Jack. See, I have. Well, I won't get into it. Legend has it, and this is just the worst. The name Cracker Jack came from a customer who, upon trying the treat, exclaimed, That's really a cracker, Jack. Isn't that a terrible story? The, I wouldn't even... It's so bad that I had to say it. I feel sure having know. heard you say that. I know. It is such a waste. It's a terrible story. It is the worst. I read that, and I'm like, boy, we need to share that with our listeners because yeah. it's just so stupid. Okay, moving on. Do, uh, do that one. That one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let me go find it. All right, so... Moving from food to beverages, Paps Blue Ribbon. That's crazy. PBR. 1893. So the beer originated from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Jeez, all sorts of Wisconsin shout outs today. Mm -hmm. In 1844, it was run by partners Frederick Pabst and Philip Best. The brewery showcased the beer at the World's Columbian Expo, Expo in 1893. Also, the Chicago World's Fair. Yes. They were twins. They were. Yeah. Uh, originally called Best Select. That's what the beer was named. Ugh. And then Pabst Select. And because they won. The beer, right, was named America's Best at the fair. And it's believed that because of that win, that's why it became Pabst Blue Ribbon. So you realize the fact we're talking about Pabst Blue Ribbon beer right now, every single hipster in the world that's, oh, I love PBR, so is going to just download and listen to our podcast now. This is This is accurate. We have to put that a hashtag in whenever we post this. We'll uh, get, we should. We'll get all the oh, hipsters. so many hipsters. And they love podcasts, I oh, assume. They love it. I, I know you don't drink, but do you remember a time when PBR was very cheap? I remember, and it was like the worst beer and, ever. Oh, it's still the worst beer ever. Yeah. And now Oh, it's, so it doesn't taste any better. Oh, no, no. It's still the same so garbage. So why do they drink it? I think it was because it was really cheap, and then it was kind of ironic and cool. And oh. now it's expensive because dirty hipsters want that. Hipsters I mean, are all about the irony, people, aren't they? They are all about the irony. So a couple other inventions. Yeah, I, I got some inventions, like not food related. Did you stuff see the now. zipper was invented? Yeah. Here. What, yeah. Did people, what did people do? I guess that's where button flies and like Levi's. I was gonna say Velcro, but listen, probably not. Listen to our Levi uh, Jean episode if you didn't. But I'm, I'm guessing that's button flies. That's what they did back in the day. Yeah, invented by Whitcomb Judson as the clasp locker. Ooh, that, that sounds, sounds terrible. Cool. The telautograph, uh, this is a whole thing which was kind of interesting, but not, not that interesting. It was first patented by Elijah Gray, and I just said Elijah because I didn't know how to say it in a different episode. So okay. there, people, <laughs> in 1888, <laughs> I'm learning, and uh, it was basically a primitive fax machine. So that's kind of interesting, right? Really? Converting handwriting into electrical impulses, which could be sent and then reproduced that's exactly know, at what a distance. It is. That's so, pretty cool. Yeah, I got. I thought that was interesting. So, did you see uh, spray paint was invented? 
I I did the yeah. idea of like you know compressed air and all that and, and apparently this David was, Millett yeah. apparently apparently what they used to do was to paint a building you just get a whole bunch of guys with buckets and brushes you know just apparently that wasn't good enough and I, I have two big ones here one equal rights for women yeah that was a big one so, they had their own pavilion yeah they did so it was. It was still kind of a dream at that time for equal rights. Women couldn't vote and whatnot. But prominent women spoke at the fair about a number of issues, including Susan B. Anthony, labor rights reform, Florence Kelly, a bunch of other folks. When the Chicago World's Fair was funded through Congress, money was specifically allocated to make sure that women were represented. Helen Keller visited with her caretaker, whatever her name, I forget what her caretaker's name was, but she visited and she documented some of it in one of the books that she wrote. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. So to go right along with equal rights for women, the automatic dishwasher was (laughs) revealed. I feel like that was a terrible segue. (laughs) No? Oh, okay. So it was the first reliable hand-powered dishwasher invented in 1887. There's a whole story about it, but basically it was a dishwasher. Are you going to talk about the vacuum next, too? No, I'm not going to Okay, talk well, the, about the vacuum it. also debuted there. Uh, neon lights. Oh, wow. Vaseline. Vaseline, huh? Yeah. Wow, that's it's, pretty interesting. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that... The um, moving walkway? Yeah, apparently this was like uh, a big deal because... When it worked. Yeah, like the whole pier, like, or I I can't remember where they said it was, but it was like this, this, and they had seats on it. You could like sit and ride it like it was a ride almost. Yeah. So So apparently it cost five cents to ride. Yeah. So that was big money after you spent your 50 cents to get in, right? 50 cents for the Ferris wheel. Man, that's a, that's just robbery. But the Ferris wheel. (laughs) Anyways, this thing broke a lot. So it wasn't as big of a success. I did see that the hamburger was invented there as well. Could that even possibly be true? That can't be true. It first debuted in Chicago around the time of the World's Fair, it says. That has to be wrong. Do you have any other inventions? Uh, No other inventions. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, Fun facts? Anything? The Liberty Bell was actually shipped in from, uh, what did you call it? Philadelphia. Philadelphia uh, to be put on display. And it was was encapsulated with uh, fresh fruit like every day. They put. I don't know what the idea was. I saw pictures of it. It was like it was covered in oranges. For some reason. I'm, I'm sure it was like some artist thing. Interesting. I'm not exactly Artists. sure. Yeah. That's all I Liberal got. arts building. That's all you got? All yeah. right. Well, I think there was a lot of cool stuff that came from the World's Fair. Yeah. So hopefully you think so as well. Not I you, would, the listener. Yeah, you. I would love to go to one like nowadays. Me too. Do apparently, they have them? Yeah, apparently, I just did some crack research about five seconds before we started. <laughs> apparently, it's not called the World's Fair. It's called like World Expo or something like that. And in 2020, it's in Dubai. So maybe we could uh, reach out to the um, the people hosting it and see if they want unprofessional engineering there. I think we should. After this cool. episode, they probably Heck will. Yeah, they'll be like, yeah, bring these cats out to Dubai. We'll pay them big bucks because, I mean, that's what it costs to get us places. I'm sure. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully you all learned something and enjoyed the episode. So until next time. See you.